Okay. As you have actually done it before, we will trust you. Jeff, is there a PSA process where you uh, just ask and somebody jumps up? Just ask and you can have the first one because you've just asked. Oh, I don't want the first one, but I'll take it. <laughs> So, Joseph, are you here? David, who was thinking of giving a lightning talk, is he here? Not to confuse with many of the other Davids. David's all the way down. We need to stop hiring Davids. Wait another minute or two and then get started with what we have. Schedule such as it is, is over on the description of day three of the lightning talks. Looks like we're going to try for five, at least three, but we might have five. Does anybody else know that they want to do an ad so that I can plan ahead? I'll take one. Okay. Have the second one. So, Leon, you might as well set up your uh, slide and I'll say a few words. Ready? I don't see your slide. And then I have to say hello. So, hold on. Welcome to the third and final day of lightning talks. Today we have somewhere between three and five of them planned and a few ads. We're almost on top of things. Same rules as before. I'll try to keep track of who's going to be next so that we can keep things moving along. And we're going to get started with the first one now. Thank you. I'm Leon and I'm gonna talk about crypt cryptographically agile password hashing with Crypt Passphrase. Uh, what's cryptographic agility? Cryptographic agility is the ability to change the cipher that you use when you need to change it. And why would you want that? Well, Password hashing is a bit of a work in progress. Unlike most forms of cryptography, things have actually changed meaningfully in the past less than decade. It's, um, um, there, there are many hashes that have been used for passwords. Uh, a lot of simple hashes have been used like MD5 and SHA, and these are not really suitable for passwords in the first place. Uh, there have been several other schemes to compensate for this. Some of those have issues, some of, some of those issues. And even when you are using a good cipher, uh, this, the settings may not be sufficient because good password ha hashes have, have security settings, but the right settings for, for, for the year 2005 are certainly not the right year for settings for the year 2021. So therefore, crypt, crypt, crypt passphrase. Now, what is it? Essentially, it's a combination of a single encoder that you've configured to encode passwords exactly the way that you want to, and zero or more validators that can validate passwords, but that will not be created anymore for future use. For example, a simple configuration for crypt 
boss phrase can look like this. Here you specify, I want to encode my new, any new passwords in Argon2. However, I will also accept passwords that are encoded using bcrypt. Uh, it the module comes with three methods. The first, hash password, does exactly what you expect it to do. It uses the encoder to hash the password so that you can store that. Then there's verify password, which will identify which of the allowed verifiers is the appropriate one for your password, and then verify is this correct. However, there is a third method, which is actually very important needs rehash. That will this will look at your hash and tell you if if it's in a, if it's correctly encoded for the new enc encoding or if it's in an old encoding or if it's for example using an old setting that's no longer deemed secure enough. This way you can you can upgrade your passwords increment incrementally from an older less safe encoding to a newer more safe encoding. Um, in fact, you can do this so gradually that you can first switch to using this module and only afterwards actually switch the cipher, which ma makes for a very easy transition. The configuration doesn't even have to be hard coded. You can actually make this part of the configuration of your app and then just change and change the entire cipher just by changing a setting. It's available for Perl and for Raku. Perl one currently has more backends, but that will hopefully be resolved in the future. But also in Raku, you shouldn't be needing most of the legacy encodings anyway. Thank you for your attention. Not hearing a gong, Joffrey. <laughs> I was about to hit the bell. Anyway, thank you. And Joseph is setting up. And Bruce, you have the first one. OK. I try and do this every year. And it works much better face to face. So I'll just need a little help. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Bruce Gray, again. Uh, it's been a great conference. Take a moment and try to self-identify. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but this is for all of you for whom this is not just your first Pearl conference, but your first real contact with the Pearl community. There's always more than a few. Is it you? Welcome to the Pearl community. Now that you're here, don't disappear. Uh, I'm a Perlmongers guy. I want you to know that it is worthwhile to have some kind of face-to-face -face or even just this kind of distance, uh, interpersonal connection beyond any open source project that you're involved in. There are plenty of places to volunteer and I encourage you to do that. But if you don't have a Perlmongers group near you, as was said earlier in the conference, you are hereby empowered to start one yourself. Early on, I used to give uh, a lot of ways you could participate uh, community-wise, and now there are pages for it. So I've just posted two at the link for Pearl community and Reku community, but they are both the same community. We just keep uh, slightly different lists. So I hope to see you all next year and before that, too. Thank you. All right. Joseph, do you have some slides? Sure. How's oh, that? there they are. Very good. Everybody hear me? A and Daniel, you'll be the next speaker. Crystal clear, Joe. Great. OK, so I just dumped a bunch of links into the chat because no one can cut and paste off a Zoom window. Uh, I'm Joseph Brenner. I wanted to say a couple words about handling roughly parallel data structures in Perl, in particular, doing arithmetic on them. Uh, like this particular line of code 
I think it's pretty clear what it should do, though Perl does nothing useful with it actually, because here you've got these two quantities, they have broken down by two digit country code. You probably want them to line up, right? Subtract German from German, Spain from Spain, and so on. But that's not actually what happens. Uh, pop quiz, not that this is gonna stump anyone here. Here is uh, what actually does happen when you do that. Well, now myself being an old timer, I expected that we would get bucket reports there. That you would get strings that kind of reflect what's going on in the hash, but don't really tell you anything useful, except that they're false when the hash is empty. But around Perl 525, it turns out that's actually changed to account of hash keys, which I did not pick up at the time. And that actually seems like it might be useful, though it doesn't help us in this case. Still, nice little improvement from the Perl 5 porters. Uh, doing pretty well for something that everybody knows is dead, you know? In any case, right? So, I'm sure we can all knock out some Perl code to do more or less the right thing with this, like this, for example, just three simple lines. We go over the keys and do it explicitly, except there's a bug in here. I would call it a somewhat subtle bug. It's kind of insidious in that we could have a key in cost that is not there in gross. So we could be silently dropping information on the floor with some code that looks like it's working in most cases, but will suddenly die if there's an odd one with a missing key. So myself, I'm a little paranoid about this. I tend to write things like this these days. Uh, you grab the keys from both, join them together, uniquify them and loop over those. And that's fine, but it's getting, uh, getting a bit much. Uh, and here we introduce the CPAN module I wrote some years back. This is perhaps the simplest possible case you might want to reach for this. It does recursive descent through arbitrary Perl structures, looks for things that seem like numbers and try to, tries to perform that indicated numeric operation on them. And that certainly works in this case. Uh, this is the kind of case I wrote it to work with. This is a stripped down version of a data structure I found out in the wilds. Uh, I had to do maintenance on code that used something like this. It's hash and hash of hash, a uh, year on the first level, month on the second, country code on the bottom. Uh, I wouldn't have done it this way. I mean, the months, I mean, you could use an array reference, right? But anyway, this is actually something I actually found in use, uh, including some oddities like this, like the tax rate was thrown in apparently for reference. Um, There's some text comments. Uh, it's fictional numbers, sources Doombox. That guy Doombox is making stuff up again. And uh, cost is broken down pretty much the same way. That's what I mean by parallel. And roughly it means that you can have holes in it. You can have keys on one side that aren't in the other. Things can vary a little bit. Like this comment here is a little different from the other comment, even though the source string is the same. And when you run this through data math, well, in this case, I would recommend using the skip key patterns feature. So you can tell it to ignore those tax rate fields. Uh, because otherwise you're just gonna subtract two identical numbers and get a tax rate of zero, which is kind of meaningless and unlikely. Uh, I'm not dumping the entire structure here, just doing some checks of uh, some probe values. Uh, 2016, February, Germany, 935, subtract 35, you're supposed to get 900. That's exactly what you get. Mildly interesting is this maybe, that Doomvox is the same on both sides, so it's passed through unchanged. The default behavior is that if there's a difference in the strength fields, they're joined together with a vertical bar rather than throw information away. You can modify that a little bit with some different settings. Oh, this is the code itself. Don't really have a lot of time to talk about it too much. There's an actual, oh, and that's that. Let's call that it. What's time that I thought? You still have time. That's the warning. Oh, the warning. Okay. 
any case, there's a, a full recursive descent. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll make the point that I don't do an eval on these operators. I'm not quite that dumb. Though I am dumb enough to forget to do an else down here. I wonder why there's no else error if you give it something it doesn't know how to deal with. But, you know, whatever. Maybe I'll fix that sometime. Uh, this code uses scalar classify, which is just a wrapper around the built-in ref and the library functions ref type and looks like number. Tries to find out everything it can about a reference and give you useful information about it. Uh, these are out pretty much where you think they would be. Uh, this, however, is now something completely different. It says, how would you do this in Reku? Uh, back to the simple example. It's actually a pretty nice tight solution, really. We use mix. It's kind of like fuzzy sets. It's a built-in data type. It's like a set, except the values can be rational numbers. Uh, this is the set operation operator in Reku in ASCII form. And that actually does exactly what we need. It lines them up according to keys, subtracts off the values, and gives you the right answer. So that's uh, a nice win for Reku, I think, once you understand the, the slight oddity of the mix types now behaves with set operations. And that, in my mind, raises the question of how would I re-implement data math in Reku? I've only just started thinking about this. I'll probably go into this a little more in the next Reku study group on June 20th, which will be available in a Zoom session near you if you have any interest. Um, I don't know, the pieces all seem to be there, but it seems to me like there ought to be some tight uh, idiomatic solution. I have a feeling I'm missing it. There's gotta be something a little better here. But anyway, let's call that it. I'll wrap that up right there. The slides are up at GitHub. The slides are actually uh, pro code. Uh, more or less. And I dumped my links into the chat window at the start. So hopefully those are visible to anybody who cares. Not formatted very well, but what can you do? So thanks much. Daniel, you're setting up and JJ has the ad. Hi, um, just a quick announcement uh, that um, I mentioned it during my talk very briefly, but uh, I work at CV Library and we are hiring. We're specifically looking for uh, Perl and Go developers. So if you are interested in Go or if you've used it, uh, you are already suitable. Um, I added a link to our uh, job post in the wiki for the conference. So go take a look and come join us. Since it looks like David has, is not going to be able to make it, he told me he probably wouldn't. This is the last talk. So when this one finishes, if anybody has any more ads, particularly if you're hiring and haven't mentioned it yet, we will go with them then. And you are all set. All right. Um, so I was not planning to give this lightning talk and don't entirely know what I'm going to say, but I was excited enough about it that I, I wanted to share with you all. Um, and I'm just gonna talk for a bit until I get gonged off the stage. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about EPE, my work in progress web framework for Raku. Um, and uh, if you have, have done any front end web development in the last few years, you're, you're almost certainly familiar with React, the JavaScript framework that is extremely popular and still you know, growing strong um, and has really captured a lot of developer attention and people have found it extremely productive in large part due to its declarative component driven model for uh, building web applications. And, um, and so EPE is, is very much the idea 
uh, it very much built with the idea of bringing that same declarative model to building web pages and web applications in Raku. Um, one of the things that people say about React that that really help sell it to JavaScript developers is that it's it's just JavaScript. Um, and of course, as a, a Raku developer, I, I want to say, well, it's just JavaScript, and and maybe that's not such a great thing from my point of view. But another reaction I have to that is, is it really just JavaScript? Um, one of the, the key developers behind um, React, Dan Abramoff, who I'll return to later, has, has a post that talks about React as a user interface runtime and points out all the things that React does that are not part of JavaScript, not part of uh, web browser APIs, but that, that go into making it easy and productive to build React applications. And React really does do a lot for web developers and adds a lot of things to JavaScript. Um, and a lot of those things are really good ideas, but they're not really React ideas. They're, they're just good computer science fundamental ideas. And for that reason, there, uh, so many of them are already built into Raku. Um, so you, you know, React has use state, we can declare variables with the state declarator. They spread their props out to sort of simulate named arguments. We have named arguments. They you, allow you to return a fragment um, instead of a full component. We have slips that can slip a list into another. And I, I could go down this entire uh, chart. Uh, one that I'll, I'll call out is um, with context. Uh, Dan Abramoff again has has said explicitly that context is just a way of simulating dynamic variables. Um, there's a reason that dynamic variables exist in Elisp. Um, they're very helpful for building UIs and component-driven things where you, where someone may be um, using you know using code from someone else and need to insert a variable into it. They can be abused, of course, but there's a reason. Uh, React had to implement that entire API. Again, if when we have dynamic variables built in, um, we don't have to do that. So, so Raku is actually an excellent fit for this sort of UI development um, because we can leverage all the work that went into language design and not need to re-implement or reinvent the wheel the way React does when it's building on a JavaScript foundation um, instead. Um, so this is a, a very simple fragment of a React component that is um, that is not. I'm not holding this up as a great bit of React code. I, I just happened to grab it from the React tutorial um, the, where you're building a, a tic-tac-toe game, and so it's it's not great React code, but it's code that they sort of hold out as um, as what a, a beginner might write. Here's the same thing written in the syntax that I have for uh, Epe. So, you know, one thing that I think is extremely notable about that, in addition to leveraging things like named parameters and um, various features of, of Raku, is that it is significantly shorter, four lines instead of 12. And this is not about, uh, you know, golfing our solution or anything, but I, I do think that. The shorter the, the code we write, the better in a lot of ways, especially here. Uh, returning again to something else that Dana Abramoff has said, um, has, he has said that he likes to, instead of thinking about the big O notation, likes to think about the bug O notation, um, which says that describing how much an API slows down as your code base grows, and has gone on to say that part of what he likes about React is that it makes the uh, number of bugs proportional to the uh, tree height uh, in component trees. What that means is the more concisely we can write our uh, UI components, the fewer bugs we can have. My hope with FA is that it will, uh, that it's much more concise syntax will allow um, much more robust components that are not only faster and more productive to write, but also uh, leave a less surface area for the, for the bugs to hide in. And, um, 
I have a tremendous amount more I would love to tell you about this, and I look forward to having the code in a point where I can share it. I've been hacking on it pretty intensely for about eight months, but I'm not sure I have anything else that I can share in 30 seconds. So I think I will stop it there. Okay, Todd, you might as well set up now. And does anybody have anything to advertise? Yes. Go for it. Can I share a screen? Oh, sure. Go for it. So inspired by the uh, kind of the mood in parts of the talks and uh, especially the last talk, but during the conference, I thought, uh, why not set up a small, uh, nice site that showed uh, that Perl is quite nice? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, so if you go to shinypearl.com, I have just added some small snippets of codes, code that I like uh, about Perl, like simple examples of how to do simple things. And it has very few examples still. So uh, I appreciate if people could send some pull requests to the, to the GitHub address. Just type shinypearl.com and you can find the address. Thank you. Anyone else? Then I will take this time to point out that there are some jobs that have been posted on the wiki, including where I work at Perceptics. The main code is in Perl. We're spreading out, so there are other options. That, it's all yours, Todd. OK, well, I want to uh, thank everybody for attending. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, we, we actually hesitated whether we were going to do this conference uh, this year, uh, given it was again going to be online, and I, you know, everybody is worn out by uh, Zoom. So, it, but I, I have to say, just the same, it was good to see people. It was good to talk about my my uh, favorite programming language and uh, talk with like-minded folks. Um, I want to go ahead and thank uh, CPanel for sponsoring the event and, and donating to the Pearl Foundation. Uh, I want to thank uh, speakers uh, who uh, took the time to write their slides. You know, it, 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 some, some of these talks are only 20 minutes or 50 minutes, but they are um, 10 plus hours in many cases of people preparing their slides and getting them just right. And I, I really appreciate everybody's time and making that happen. I want to thank you, thank all the volunteers who took time to help make sure this conference uh, went off uh, uh, well and effectively. And uh, finally, uh, stop me if you've seen these slides before, because, uh, but I promise this is the last time I will do these slides. <laughs> you are finally uh, cordially invited to attend the Pearl and Raku conference in Houston next year. Uh, this is a shot of downtown Houston. We're going to be a little bit north of that. Uh, if you come a little early, you can uh, just shoot a short ways down to Galveston and see the Gulf of Mexico. And the beach totally looks like that. I promise. Uh, you, can, you can go to NASA and, and see where the moon landing happened. Uh, we have lots of breweries all over Houston, so lots of beer. Uh, we have world-class museum and zoos uh, for you to visit and spend time at. Houston and Texas, we're all about Tex-Mex, not the same as Mexican food. Tex-Mex is its own thing. Uh, and we even have indoor rain. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this was an actual shot of the uh, Houston, uh, the last time we had a conference in Houston, and it rained so much that we had humidity that caused the windows on the inside of the place to, to fog up. And uh, uh, so uh, we've, we have a date, we have a venue. Uh, we've, uh, we've had to move that, uh, the time on that venue twice, but we uh, promise we're, we're gonna be doing this June 22nd through 24th uh, next year in Houston. Uh, if you would like to uh, contribute and help make it a great event, uh, we'd love to have you if um, 
uh, if we will have the website up probably within the next week. So if you were looking for how to book the hotel or, or plan the event, please reach out to us. Uh, you can, uh, the easiest place is to reach us on Slack. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next year. Thanks, guys. Yay. Hey, thank you. Thank you, thank Todd, you. for doing this three years in a row. <laughs> thank you so much, Todd. Yay, thanks. I, mean, that I look forward to seeing everybody stuff. next year. Thanks. thanks it was good to talk to you all. This was everybody. Good. The Pro Conference in Houston, the third time's the charm. Thank <laughs> you.